Well, the meaning of life is to find your gift, and the purpose of life is to give it away. Pablo Picasso's words ring true for my guest today. He spent the first innings of his life as an entrepreneur, focusing on knowledge, ideas, and built a global corporation that democratized the use of technology. In his second innings, he's using his gifts, his power, influence, and his money to try and create a more just and equal world. Bill Gates, always a pleasure. Thanks very much for speaking to us here on CNBC TV 18. Let me start by talking to you about goalkeepers, because when you first published the report in 2017 you said there is more doubt than usual about the world's commitment to development do you believe that there is less political will even today to try and address the developmental needs is it getting harder to pitch the case for developmental aid to developed economies well anytime you have uh, the like a 2008 financial crisis or you know Syrian civil war with lots of refugees the world is going to get fairly short term mm -hmm. and you know think about dealing with those and countries you know can turn inward a bit when they're facing those challenge challenges the long term issues of getting rid of extreme poverty uh, solving climate change you know innovating uh, say for farmers so that they can deal with the, the new climate and still uh, feed themselves these issues can get squeezed away mm. and so we're glad the United Nations has ambitious goals uh, for 2030. We're glad that every year we get to say, okay, how are we doing? You know, goalkeepers is a, a checkpoint, and we often show what the results will be if we lose focus, uh, and you know, for say HIV, if we stop working hard mm -hmm. on the innovation and, and delivery there, or we show uh, if we get more focused how, whether it's girls' education mm. or reduction in malnutrition, some amazing things can happen. Uh, so yes, it's always a risk uh, that countries are turning inward, and certainly there are political leaders now that are more nationalistic than uh, thinking about mm. all of humanity. Mm. Uh, you know, Melinda Gates said that uh, this was meant to be a wake-up call to leaders of certain countries. Has it got their attention, whoever you were hoping to address by way of the first report? Are you now seeing people take the development cause more seriously post uh, the report and what it said? Well, yeah, I think it is impressive that uh, the aid commitments have been maintained despite this wave of uh, more in, inward looking uh, politics. The U.S. Uh, maintained its aid levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, the UK, you know, is very generous, all the way up at 0.7 percent. You know, Germany's aid budget has gone up. France is committed to increase theirs, and so, you know, although we could always use more resources, in fact, uh, the these global causes, the innovation that will give us new tools, uh, whether that's vaccines or mm. seeds, uh, that part, the science part, is actually moving even faster mm. than we would have expected. Uh, on the on the ground implementation, it's always quite a range. Mm -hmm. You know, at goalkeepers, we bring in uh, people from, say, Rwanda or Ethiopia who are getting ahead of uh, the forecast and saying, "Okay, tell us how you did it." Yeah. Uh, and then we'll, you know, take tougher tougher areas like northern Nigeria and say, "Okay, they're not uh, fixing the primary health care yet. What can all of us do?" Uh, to get it back on track. Mm. You know, you've spoken about how some of these targets are realistic and some are aspirational. As you sit here today, uh, which are the ones you believe that the, the deficit between reality and aspiration has been bridged significantly and hence more progress has been made? Where do you feel more confident today? Well, our foundation, uh, our deepest expertise is in agricultural uh, output and, and health. And on the health side, you know, we made sure that the objectives were ones that uh, there was a chance of being able to achieve. Mm. And the world's gotten so smart about these health things. Uh, the new vaccines are being adopted, you know, whether it's pneumococcus vaccine, rotavirus vaccine. In fact, India's now yeah. in the process of rolling that out over time to all the children there. Africa uh, is getting very close to achieving that goal. Uh, so health is the one mm. Uh, that that we're very deep into, and it's very primal. If you don't get the health of your kids right, then even if you send them to school, uh, they're not fully developed mentally or physically mm. to be able to benefit from that. So, you know, education and health are pretty special because that's the capital, that's your next generation. Yeah. It only pays off over that 20 years, but it's the primary thing 
that predicts what will happen to your economy in that that next generation. But do people get it? Because uh, you know the concern is that when you invest in things like physical infrastructure, the results are perhaps quicker, uh, more tangible, as opposed to investing in education, knowledge, and skills development, which is the need of the hour. But political leaders may uh, go in for more short-term intervention as opposed to long-term intervention, which pays off later. From a return on capital employed perspective, when you have this conversation with political leaders, what's the sense that you get? Well, certainly, uh, there's nothing wrong with infrastructure. Having roads no, it's not. But I'm is, just a, saying that, is an absolutely yeah. amazing thing. There is a tendency to underinvest uh, in the health of the poorest. And uh, as you say, it doesn't pay off immediately. Uh, the childhood death rate is rarely brought up during a political mm -hmm. uh, conversation. Uh, and so the, the sustainable development goals are a tool to remind people uh, that you know, all these children surviving, all of these children growing up in a healthy way, uh, how important that is. Uh, you know, India is making progress on both health and the infrastructure. Mm. You know, in both cases. But it's been a hard, it's been a hard bargain to drive even in India and getting the government to agree to spend more on health. And you've been waging that battle for a while. Right. So I'd say the best progress has been on taking what is spent and making sure that uh, the quality of the system, the number of kids who get vaccinated, that gets improved. I agree there's a limit on how far it can go and unless the public investment uh, in these health issues increases. And so, you know, India is a lively democracy. People will debate about that thing, but it is compared to uh, other countries, the investment level uh, probably does does need to get more of a priority. Have you looked at the insurance scheme that the Prime Minister is hoping to roll out later this year and uh, and how that could impact the health goals? Yeah, we, uh, you know, working with Niti Aog, you know, talked about how other countries have brought in insurance, you know, how they use private sector capacity to help in the health sector. There's some good long-term planning and over time, this goal of having insurance more broadly is very, very important. Uh, but you know, the affordability challenge means that you know that probably means the health sector mm. uh, will have to get uh, more resources for you to get up to the to uh, any substantial coverage level. Mm -hmm. Let me talk about education because we've got a Right to Education Act that uh, is almost into its 10th year in India. So while we may have addressed the enrollment challenge quite effectively, the quality of education continues to be a cause for concern. And there are no easy answers even globally. I think uh, you talk about it in the report that the strategy to actually fix the education outcome is something that is yet to sort of come together in any uh, comprehensive way. What's the way forward when you look at India? Well, there are exemplars, uh, you know, a country like Vietnam, which is substantially poorer than India. Mm. If you look at the way that they train their teachers, uh, insist that the teachers be good at doing their job, you know, have lots of ways of, me of measuring that and providing feedback, they're now at a, a level of education that's competitive uh, with the richer countries. And so it's quite an outlier uh, India, as you said, uh, has done well on access, yeah. you know, including uh, boys and girls having access. But the amount of learning, which mm. uh, that's a recent thing to really measure that, not just the attendance, but the learning, uh, India uh, has a lot of room for improvement there. In fact, given India's uh, how much the economy has grown, it's fallen behind on the quality of, of its learning outcomes. Is this going to be a space that you would want to focus more of your attention on, the foundation's attention on in India? Well, our uh, biggest spending on education by far is in our own country, the United States. Uh, you know, globally, we have health and agriculture. Uh, in the US, we have education. We are uh, starting to take some of the lessons uh, and you know, be willing to share with governments that are interested in uh, so we're working with the uh, Central Square Foundation mm -hmm. in India. Uh, uh, will be a partner uh, helping 
you know, share best practices about uh, how uh, for the Indian states that want to, uh, they can get uh, more learning taking place. Mm -hmm. Since you spoke of agriculture, the challenge that we face in India today is that at one level you have record production, but you've actually seen farm income decline over the last few years. Uh, how do you, you know, ensure that this promise that the government has made about doubling farm income is in fact a reality? Are there global examples uh, that you've seen that are working effectively on the ground that could perhaps be incorporated into India as we move up this value chain of moving more towards food processing and so on and so forth? Well, a big reason uh, that the Asian exemplars, where China is by far the biggest, that they were able to drive up economic growth was that they were able to uh, make farm efficiency, productivity per labor much higher. And then that freed up labor that went into other activities, including, in their case, uh, they had the right policies to be competitive in, in global manufacturing. They had the logistics, the infrastructure, the labor and land laws that created that mm. as the primary source of increased employment. So you can't, uh, uh, you, you really do need that shift because otherwise, you know, what you'd have to be saying is that the, the cost of food would be going up very, very dramatically, yeah. which, you know, that's not the goal. You want the urban poor to mm. also be uh, advancing at the same time. There are some high value added opportunities, there's some export opportunities, uh, but as you get uh, improvement in productivity, that labor shift mm. is the only thing that can keep the per, per farmer income going mm. up without having the, the food prices be uh, too high for the urban poor. Mm -hmm. Since we're talking about labor and one of the challenges that you speak of in the report, uh, an area where significant progress has been made is poverty alleviation, but now uh, you believe that that is going to be a challenge because it collides with the demographic reality and perhaps some of that is true for India as well. What's the way forward and how concerned are you today? Well, the world beat a very ambitious goal in reducing extreme poverty. Uh, it's gone down a lot. Uh, China was the biggest contributor mm -hmm. to that. India was the second biggest contributor to that. Uh, and so there are clear policies, you know, getting kids in school, uh, understanding, you know, malnutrition, which, you know, India has a whole mission mm -hmm. or organized on that, which there's a lot, they're a lot smarter about how they can really uh, get those levels down. So Asia as a whole, with very few exceptions, like, you know, Yemen or Afghanistan, is on a track to take this extreme poverty and get it to very low levels. Uh, still a lot of learning to be mm. done. Uh, you know, China wants to go all the way to zero people in extreme poverty and has uh, an impressive program to do that. The place that's a concern mm. is largely Africa. Uh, the population growth in Africa is very, very high. Uh, there's only a billion people today there, but by the end of the century, that'll be up to four billion. Right. And so most of the population growth on the entire planet's mm. in uh, the continent that is uh, by far the poorest. And so it's going to be a real challenge uh, to keep making progress on extreme poverty unless we take the lessons from India and China and we're able to apply those in Africa, particularly in the uh, larger countries in Africa, mm. we could actually uh, see a leveling out or even an increase in that extreme poverty number that you know, we all want to see that, that get to zero. So Africa uh, looms in front of us. Mm. You know, do the young people there get into school, get a good education, are they well nourished? Uh, only if the world collectively uh, takes the best lessons and helps Africa with that uh, are we likely to get on the path where their incomes go up, their education goes up, which actually means their population mm. won't grow uh, quite as quickly, which makes the whole job a lot easier. So on balance, uh, you know, last year you were 
you were candid about the fact that uh, perhaps we would miss some of the targets as far as the SDG was concerned by 2030. Do you feel a little more confident about meeting them today or do you feel that uh, not much has changed in the last 12 months since the last report? Well, the year um, uh, shows us that we're making very good progress on the health goals, uh, shows us the kind of upstream innovation where we need new tools like a HIV vaccine, a TB vaccine, you know, seeds that can deal with drought because of the, the climate change. I'd say the innovation piece has gone faster than I would have expected. We'll be sharing examples of that. The global priority of helping everyone, including the poorest, that's always, um, a little bit crowded out by near-term challenges, mm. you know, whether it's, you know, Brexit or the U.S. trade policies. Uh, and so we do worry that, you know, we only <clears throat> get sort of broad attention on these long-term goals during this one week. Uh, and so getting out to people, okay, where the generosity of the rich countries mm. and, you know, better policies uh, need to help out. I think you know that's very important because the political commitment uh, certainly uh, you know it's it's not guaranteed and it, it's possible that uh, the issue of helping Africa or mm. all the poorest uh, will get lost in all the other noise. Since you're talking about political commitment, any fresh conversations with President Trump on these issues? Uh, I haven't uh, seen him for a number of, of months. Uh, you know, he's got a new Secretary of State uh, who I went in and talked to about Africa and about how we work with the U.S. government. Uh, what was the response? And, well, the, the budget levels have been maintained. And so, you know, the U.S. role in HIV reduction, the U.S. role in the malaria attack, uh, there's a lot that, you know, the U.S. has prioritized mm -hmm. and continued to fund it at various generous levels. And, you know, in, in those areas, uh, over half the money that goes to Africa to help with those problems comes out of the United States. Now, you know, will all these trade issues overwhelm that? You know, how does that affect some of these very fragile economies? Uh, there's always uh, plenty to be worried about. So, you know, our voice on behalf of these mm. poor countries that which of these policy choices would avoid creating damage to those most in need, you know, we see that as a, a key role that we play. I'll come to trade in just a second, but, you know, since you talked about vaccines, uh, what, about $15.5 billion over the last 10 years that you've spent on the vaccine program through the Gates Foundation. Uh, what role do you see specifically for, for India uh, from this perspective? Because it is a, a generic... Uh, a hub as far as uh, pharma is concerned. Uh, we have the world's largest vaccine manufacturer based in India as well. What specific role do you see for India from the vaccine perspective? Well, India, um, by keeping the quality of its, its drug regulation high, uh, has been able to serve its own needs with very low cost vaccines. Uh, serum being you know, a great example of that, but uh, you know, BioE brought a lot of companies in India are at the forefront of very high volume, mm. very low priced vaccines. And you know, we've provided <clears throat> hundreds of millions of dollars to these organizations to help them build new factories, uh, create new products, you know, make sure that they're taking a very high volume, uh, low price approach. And so it's fantastic. India adopted the rotavirus vaccine. Mm -hmm. It'd been you know, over 20 years uh, until a new adoption that happened. The pneumococcus vaccine is starting to be rolled out. Uh, and so as we look at the uh, child survival rate that's improving quite a bit in India, this vaccine coverage deserves a fair bit of credit for that. Mm -hmm. And so India will continue to be uh, where a very high percentage of the world's vaccines are made, and it's moving up so that it's even doing new vaccines, you know, like Raj Bond uh, helped with this uh, brought rotavirus vaccine. Mm. Now that's a, a very high quality, but actually a lower cost tool that won't only be used in India, it will also be used as the uh, big vaccine in Africa. Mm -hmm.
So uh, important from a vaccine perspective, what about sanitation? Because this has been the Prime Minister's pet project, Swachh Bharat, uh, and you have worked with the government uh, uh, on many levels on this front. What gives you confidence about the fact that we will be able to achieve the targets that we've set out uh, for India under this program? And, and what, do you, what is sort of uh, <laughs> any ideas specifically from here that you think are exportable? Well, we're partnering uh, with Indian companies uh, to say, okay, how can you either process the waste uh, or eventually have a toilet that doesn't create that waste? And I do give the government a lot of credit that most governments don't talk about sanitation. And so, you know, it's a hidden problem. It's causing a lot of misery. It causes a lot of disease. Mm. It's part of why the malnutrition rates in India haven't come down as fast uh, as everybody wants them to is because the sanitation issue uh, is actually quite poor, both in rural issue and in urban issue, and you can see that in mm. the rivers, uh, like the Ganges. So the idea of, okay, is, are there the incentives to process the sanitation? You know, even the railroad, okay, what are they uh, doing about these issues? Mm. It takes political leadership because you have to have capital investment, you have to save just dumping raw sewage right. into the rivers is no longer going to be allowed. Uh, so we have a number of pilot projects uh, that are going on with new processing techniques, bringing the cost of that processing down. Uh, we had our toilet fair in India where we showed some of those new innovations. Uh, toilet fair later this year uh, will be done in China because mm. there's manufacturers there uh, that are going to be making some of those pieces. So India and China are you know, two really big partners. Uh, I know a lot more progress will be made on sanitation because the government's been willing to speak mm -hmm. out about it than it would have been made without that that big push. Mm -hmm. uh, before I move to talk to you about uh, the giving pledge, let me ask you about what the uh, focus areas are going to be for this year now as we approach the 2030 deadline. I mean, is there anything in specific that you want to spend the next 12 months over, any target in particular? Well, we're talking a lot about youth and and where whether you you have their health, their nutrition, and education strong enough mm. that they can make a big impact. So because of that delay that you only see 20 years later uh, that you've done the right thing in that, it is uh, often not invested in, not measured very well. You know, the disappointing learning outcomes in most countries, uh, you know, who's, who's going to bring that up? But it, sh it should be discussed. Mm. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's so much work to be done on that. So I'd say that idea of where are the kids being born and are we uh, going to invest in them and the impact that has, that's a, our biggest message for this mm. year. Let me then talk to you about current issues. Uh, we're in the midst of tariffs and retaliatory tariffs with the U.S. imposing tariffs, China responding, the EU is in on it as well, uh, including <laughs> India. How do you see the global economy today? Uh, as we look at political leaders who are perhaps looking more inwards than outwards, what is the impact likely to be on global trade? Well, the global economy uh, actually is doing quite well right yeah. now. The you know, estimates have actually been pushed up a little bit. Uh, U.S. growth, China growth, India growth. You know, those are, uh, it's rare that those are all going fairly well. Mm. Certainly, these trade issues are scary in that if you get people turning inwards, raising up tariffs, uh, the global economy is not going to do as well. There's mm. huge benefits to trade. You know, take... If one country is growing too much of a crop, the fact that uh, uh, you can, you know, send it, yeah. say, to Africa where it's needed. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, when you get a bumper crop, then mm. you get a price collapse because you don't have that that global demand. And so, uh, agricultural has been an area where a number of countries, including India, you know, had to think: okay, mm. how willing are they uh, to to be a, a part of that global trading system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not in the midst of a full-blown trade war just yet. What do you believe is likely to be the tipping point? Well, I'm, I don't have a, a crystal ball on this, uh, but uh, the rhetoric that 
okay, you know, we'll use trade tariffs and we'll force somebody to do something, that can escalate. Mm. And, and so, you know, we could end up with a lot of tariffs uh, and all the plans people have made about assuming their global supply chains will work and that they're able to do exports and imports, you know, that alone will be quite a burden on uh, economic growth and therefore for job creation. Mm -hmm. And in all of these things, you always have to say, okay, the poorest countries, you know, they're the ones who are just barely uh, getting by. Mm -hmm. And so it's always interesting to think, you know, how do we avoid them suffering? You know, even Indian farmers want, yeah. you know, their, their crops to be exportable. One of the big challenges, uh, especially markets like India face today, is uh, joblessness. Uh, you know, employment rates in the U.S. have, have looked uh, good for, for at least the last year or so. Uh, but the challenge for India is not just the fact that the world is looking insular and what that does to manufacturing and supply chains, uh, but, you know, we do have the demographic advantage that we need to now start to capitalize on. Uh, in a world of technology and AI and bots, what's the way forward? What would you be concerned about when it comes to job creation in a country like India? Well... The number one predictor of, of high-paying jobs is the quality of education. Uh, and, you know, so whether it's malnutrition or how much learning goes on in schools, those are the, the key issues. Uh, you know, nothing comes close mm. to those key issues. Nothing about AI uh, has a, anywhere near the impact of do those kids really learn uh, while they're in primary and, and secondary school. Mm. India over time has developed, even at the university level, a lot of uh, private and public universities that are yeah. quite good. And so, you know, are they admitting people on merit? Are they allowed to be innovative? Particularly, what are the policies against those private universities? Mm. I'd say that's also more important than anything about AI, is, is that higher education level, uh, you know, is the capacity being built in you avoid a lot of regulations that make it unattractive mm. for that capacity to double or, or triple, which is, you know, get into the range of what, what India needs. Uh, certainly trade, uh, you know, will help create high value jobs. And there's a lot of things about land use, labor markets mm. uh, that are pretty basic. You know, can you compete manufacturing? Well, if you have certain labor and land laws, you cannot uh, uh, participate in that mm. and so if people really care about jobs they really focus on that you know perhaps freeing up some of the states to move faster you know China does this a lot where mm. they'll take a policy or that's kind of a national area and they'll free up some regions uh, and based on that they'll uh, see if that's the right thing for the country mm. as a whole so India because it's lucky enough to have this growing youth population, yeah. there are so many things that 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 can be improved uh, that will make sure that the issue is the quality of labor. Mm. Uh, you know, one of the challenges that we face, not just in India, um, but specifically in India at this point in time, is the stigmatization of capital. Uh, and, and, you know, post-2008, the world went through this phase where governments responded with more regulation uh, and industry responded with, you know, a discussion or a debate on capping CEO salaries and so on and so forth. Uh, do you believe that there is a need for uh, not just legislating or mandating a change in corporate behavior, which is what we've done in India, for instance, by bringing in a 2% CSR spend mandatorily, but a change in corporate behavior. I mean, uh, you know, your friend Warren Buffett's talking about the fact that move companies away from quarterly reporting so that they actually focus on the long-term good. Uh, what's the way forward, and what are your thoughts on that? Well, the private sector is where you're going to see almost all of the innovation, almost all of the job creation. There are sectors like justice, policing, uh, most of education, uh, where the government is the primary mm -hmm. uh, uh, provider. But even in, say, healthcare, you know, it's likely 
that in India, most of the new capacity, well-run capacity, will come from the private sector. So in some cases, the government will have to be a really smart regulator contracting out with that private sector capacity. There are a lot of innovators. You know, India has, uh, you know, eye care and heart hospitals and things that are the envy of the mm. world. Uh, so when the private sector is given the right incentives, you know, given the scale of, of demand, you know, some good, good things can happen. In general, you know, India's been more regulatory mm. than most other countries. And in some sectors, that's gone down quite a bit. In some sectors, uh, you know, that still remains the case. Those are our political questions. But you, there's certainly an opportunity to get way more out of the private sector if, you know, people are willing mm. uh, to unleash it to a, a slightly greater degree. Oh, that's idiot specific, but globally, I mean, what changes would you like to see in corporate behavior, for instance? Do you think, for instance, that this move towards uh, not focusing or obsessing with quarterly reporting is a good idea? I don't think that's a gigantic thing. I mean, uh, you know, I do think there are some reforms that would be slightly helpful, but, you know, the companies that have done well, these technology companies, they're not focused on quarterly earnings, you know, they're building things that are in mm. five, ten year type investment cycles and, you know, that's helped them to do extremely well. You know, my optimism about the future is based on driving innovation. So mm. anything where government R&D uh, has increased, anything where the incentives to the private sector uh, to do more R&D are increased, you know, that's where I see that will surprise people. Mm who right now are, are not seeing the innovation or even worrying, okay, will the innovation actually uh, be a problem in, in some ways? Uh, that R&D piece is, is where we can surprise people, and the private sector will be a gigantic part of that. But do you see that the trust deficit is getting in the way of this private-public collaboration, especially when it comes to areas like R&D? Uh, and is, is that holding us back? Well... I'd say that countries are less uh, anti-market today uh, than they've been in the past. Uh, you know, in, in Africa, you know, part of the reason that Kenya, Ethiopia have done well is they've taken very rigid uh, socialistic policies mm. and unleashed, both in the small business and the, the large business there, they've unleashed that capacity. So we don't have many people today, mm. you know, saying we should go back to having, uh, you know, politicians pick, oh, this company should make this product and have these limits. Mostly, we're in a deregulatory uh, move. Now, every time, you know, somebody gets rich corporately uh, and they haven't benefited their customers, then, you know, it causes people to question that. But the trend is, 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 is fairly positive. Mm. Um, you know, government is the referee. And so as you reduce government corruption, people's trust that, okay, that referee is there and the, you know, private sector in terms of bids or mm. uh, permits or things like that isn't uh, getting special treatment mm -hmm. by the government. You want to build up that, that kind of trust. And so, you know, people like Transparency International that are really reporting, okay, where is corruption in these various countries? Um, that's an area, you know, even our foundation is anxious to say, okay, government, uh, when it allows corruption, mm. it ends up discrediting the private sector because unfortunately the private sector will, at least some members yeah. will take advantage if the, you know, licensing auction isn't, uh, you know, open and, mm. and properly run. Mm. Uh, a current debate that's on in India and globally as well around data. Now, you've been an advocate of Aadhaar. Uh, you've supported it. You've defended it. And I think that the questions arise not on, on uh, whether it's a good idea or not, but whether it should be made mandatory for every citizen, for every service possible, because it was envisaged as people accessing government subsidy uh, using the Aadhaar card to avoid duplication and leakages. Uh, the question then is that 
India today is still grappling with putting in place a privacy framework, a privacy regulation, a data protection regulation. Uh, in that context, then, does it make sense, even though the matter is in court today, to link Aadhaar to every possible service? Well, Aadhaar is just something that avoids you pretending to be somebody else, that, you know, you can have, uh, you know, fake people on the pay government payroll. Mm -hmm. Adhar, you know, prevents you being on that payroll as, as a ghost worker. It prevents you from collecting things that you shouldn't collect or accessing a health record you shouldn't have access to. So the basic Adhar mechanism mm. is an identity mechanism. And so it's too bad if somebody thinks that because Adhar is there, that in and of itself creates a privacy problem. The privacy issue is about the application, mm. okay? If you're using Adhar for your taxes or your benefits, uh, who has access yep. to that information? The, you know, the idea that you have an identity, uh, wow, that's only, you know, only in some weird philosophical thing. That's not a, it's an arbitrary 12-digit number. It, it, it's the policies for mm. the application. Mm who can see the land registry, uh, who can, you know, certainly things like voting privacy mm. or medical record privacy, uh, you know, everybody agrees that's super important. Mm. Tax records, okay, you know, people will vote, you know, how visible should corporate, what they pay or don't right. pay or, you know, individual taxation, is there visibility about those things? So it's, it's strange to see what are, legitimate privacy issues being turned into mm. that you should be able to you know still have ghost workers on the on the payroll that mm. there's a right to to have duplicates uh you know which has cost so much money and so much credibility yeah. Yeah. you know even the the various things that have gone to adhar cutting out the middleman uh you know it there's no credibility when the rich people end up taking mm. these benefit programs and being able to capture all the money. Uh, the inefficiency is is so unjust, mm. and and so uh, you know now a lot of that fraud, you know, for the the programs that have adopted it isn't there. Mm. So you know, huge upside uh, if if people care about government quality. But since you do, I mean, you know, if data is now the new commodity, if data is the new oil, and we're still trying to put in place a, a privacy architecture, uh, you know, we've got the GDPR rules that have uh, that have just been uh, rolled out across Europe. Uh, what's what's your sense on regulation and its impact on the way we deal with technology in light of the new regulations? Well, certainly there will be privacy regulations about your medical record, your tax record, uh, those things, that's all you know, an absolutely fine thing. Uh, GDPR is more about how the private sector yeah. deals with your records. Mm -hmm. There'll be other rules that have to do how the government deals with your records. The government, in some cases, you know, has access to things that are even more sensitive mm -hmm. uh, you know, because of their role in, in, in health care. So I don't, I don't see appropriate regulation as slowing down, uh, if, if people are rational about it, it won't slow down the adoption of these digital tools. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you about the giving pledge. Uh, what's the experience been like in India? You've got you know, Indians in India who've signed up, but you've got more who are based in the U.S. who've signed up to the Giving Pledge. What are the questions that people are asking you today uh, when you make the pitch to them? Well, the, when you join the Giving Pledge, you're not pooling money or, you know, picking particular causes. You're simply making a moral commitment mm -hmm. that as somebody who's been hyper-successful, the majority of your wealth will go for philanthropic causes. And as everyone who joins sets an example and says, hey, society should expect the super successful to engage in, in giving back in some way. Mm. And hopefully they'll take their talent and their connections, their understanding, and do it in a way that drives innovative new services. 
we have a lot of giving pledge members who have a connection to India. Mm -hmm. uh, in Dubai, a lot of the members are, are doing, uh, are from, originally from India, doing a lot of their giving in India. Uh, in India itself, we have some amazing people. Uh, and then in the U.S., as you say, uh, a lot of Indians who are here and successful, again, giving uh, back into India. And so when we get together, we talk, you know, how do you give to education in India? Mm. Uh, you know, Azam Premji has made yeah. that his big cause. In fact, amongst the Indian philanthropists, education uh, really sticks out as, as the number one cause. Mm. Uh, and yet, you know, because the government's so involved, how do you help the government innovate? How do you do pilot schools? What, what do you do? You know, Nanda Neelankani has this X step, uh, which I'm very enthused about. Mm. It shows a lot of promise uh, to help kids, even, you know, very young kids learn uh, numbers and words. And so we share success stories. We, you know, find ways that we can cooperate with each other. Uh, it's kind of a movement, mm. a global movement uh, that uh, helps, helps us do more uh, and, and, and work with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, then uh, India has its own group uh, of the India Philanthropy Initiative, which is a meeting, you know, uh, that's done every year. And I've been at uh, most of those. I'm um, missing the one this year. But uh, that's always been inspiring in terms of new people coming in and making uh, commitment to philanthropy and sharing what exactly what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, the startup ecosystem in India is exciting uh, at this point in time. Is that something that you would look at in your personal capacity or through the foundation is something that you would may want to sort of invest in, collaborate with? Well, the foundation, you know, whenever you have new agricultural tools, you know, animal vaccines, better seeds, you know, we in, on the vaccine side uh, have been a primary funder of a lot of the uh, work by the Indian vaccine companies to encourage them to do uh, new products. You know, we did our one of our first big projects was the meningitis A vaccine, mm -hmm. which was with serum. And now we've done things like that with uh, about six different manufacturers. So whenever it fits the foundation's goals, then we, you know, look, for the startups and, mm. and want to help them. But that's purely philanthropic. Uh, you know, um, well, maybe something that you would look at in the future. My final question to you then on climate change, and this is something that you're investing in personally as well. What's the role of private capital that you see in being able to achieve the targets that we've set for ourselves on the climate front? And is there much more of appreciation and understanding today when you talk to political leaders about this issue? Well, climate change uh, is difficult. Uh, we're not making the progress that the uh, Paris Accord uh, hoped we would mm -hmm. make. And only by very innovative approaches across all these uses of energy, the industrial sector, the transport sector, the agricultural sector, uh, not just electricity, although that's the one people tend to focus on, you know, that's only about a third of the emissions are related to electricity. Industry, transport, agriculture are absolutely gigantic. And so having pools of high-risk capital that back new ideas, whether it's a you know, new nuclear plant mm. that would be a lot cheaper and a lot safer, or uh, you know, a way of storing energy so you can take the sun or wind and, and have it 24 hours a day. These are very hard problems. But the, it'll be uh, government basic research funding and then uh, gigantic private sector projects mm -hmm. that literally get to billions of dollars to prove out those new approaches. So if we didn't have innovation and lots of private sector capital, uh, I would be very, I would see it as fairly bleak uh, because I see a lot of innovations. There's still a hope of getting back on track. Mm -hmm and meeting those those goals. So what's the one thing that you're most excited about this year? The one idea, the one project? Well, the understanding we have about malnutrition and why kids, they're inflamed in their gut, has to do with the microbiome, 
uh, how we're going to make sure uh, that we reduce dramatically the amount of malnutrition. This has been the year we really have gained deep insights into that. And so that's very, very exciting. Bill Gates, thanks very much for joining us on CNBC TV 18. Always a pleasure. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. With that, it is time for us to wrap up this special from all of us here. Goodbye. Many thanks for watching.